Welcome to part two of my mini-series, Railroad Crossing Safety for Commercial Motor Vehicle Drivers. In this part, we're going to cover cantilever crossings and other overhead clearance issues you might face at railroad crossings. I'm also going to briefly talk about railroad overpasses because I feel like not enough information is covered on these. But first, there are a few things I forgot to mention in the last part that I'm going to go over real quick. I actually have some interesting clips that I'm going to show you. In this first one, we're looking at a railroad crossing in Allentown, Pennsylvania. I just happened to be filming the Harrisburg line, which is currently crossing South 12th Street and Voltee Street, when I happened to see this. Basically, a distracted driver was stopping on the railroad crossing and going through his phone. When he heard the train horn, he quickly pulled across the tracks. So we're going to watch that footage real quick. Now as you can see, the train is really close to the crossing right now. In fact, if he was going any faster, he'd be close enough to trigger it. So yeah, he's doing all of the wrong things at this crossing. That was close. Yeah, that's not a, a situation you want to find yourself in. By the way, I wouldn't recommend crossing the tracks until the gates are fully raised. And here's why. It's the two-track railroad crossing. It's possible while you're crossing, the gates could go back down for a second train. Now, usually railroad crossing gates are designed so that if they can't go all the way up before there's another train coming, they'll just stay down. Never stop on the tracks. Yeah, these people aren't really making good decisions at this intersection. Look at this guy stopping right on the tracks. Okay, so a few brief things I'd like to go over about this crossing. The bells are designed to turn off when the gates are fully lowered, but if one of them can't lower, the bells will stay on until the gates go up. That's just the way they're programmed. Also, another reason you should wait until the gates are fully raised before crossing under them is because in some states it's actually against the law to cross under them while they're still raising. You can get pretty much the same ticket you would get if you ran a red light. Also, also, you don't know what that gate plans on doing. It might lower again for a second train, though it usually would stay down if there was another train coming before it could fully raise. However, it should be noted that most crossings that are programmed like that, they can go up for like one second and then come back down. Like, as long as it knows that the gate will go all the way up before the next train comes, it will go up. <laughs> and another thing is, sometimes railroad crossings have glitches in their programming referred to as malfunctions. I'm going to go over that in a, another video because there's a lot to go over with malfunctions. But basically, it's when a railroad crossing thinks a train is coming when there actually isn't one. One of the causes can be a train stopping partially on the trigger for the crossing, or even if the control box for that crossing gets struck by lightning. In any case, 
the gates could go partially up and then start going back down because it thinks another train is coming. And then you're going to end up under those gates and you're going to end up breaking them. So make sure the gates are all the way up before crossing under them, especially at a crossing with more than one track, just in case yeah, they don't lower for another train. Also, if you ever find yourself stuck under a railroad crossing gate and you're close enough to the tracks to get hit, don't be afraid to back up. You might be thinking, oh, I don't want to damage the gate, but they may not look like it. The crossing gates are actually made out of a very flimsy plastic and are pretty easily replaceable, though. I actually watched them repair one that got broken earlier, and I actually have footage of that that I'll show you in a later video. In any case, if you have no choice and you don't want to get hit by the train, you might end up having to back up. If you're far enough away that you won't get hit, though, you can stay right there, and then the gate will just raise when the train finishes crossing. Something else I'd like to point out, when I was learning how to drive a school bus, my trainer actually told me some interesting advice about this specific crossing. If you're going to cross it, please try to cross it at 12th Street and not Voltee Street. It's a lot harder to cross this intersection at Voltee Street than at 12th Street. For one thing, 12th Street has the right of way, so you're not going to end up having to worry about stopping at the stop sign. And it's really difficult with these types of intersections because you find yourself having to inch forward to see if it's safe down the road. and uh, But then you can't just stop on the railroad crossing, so what are you going to do about that? It's a lot easier at 12th Street because you don't have a stop sign. And you can see more easily down the tracks in both directions. So he would actually recommend you, you cross at 12th Street. And I'd recommend this too because it is a lot easier. Now, when I first saw this video on YouTube, I became a little bit concerned. I remember thinking to myself, well, shoot, I didn't know it was possible to hit these. How tall are these things anyway? How tall was the trailer when it uh, passed under these? So I did a little bit of research, and I did find out how tall these cantilever signals are. This website belongs to a company that manufactures cantilever crossing devices as well as other railroad equipment. On their website, they state that their cantilevers are 17 feet 6 inches of clearance, which meets most states' minimum height requirements. However, some states might have a higher or lower requirement, so in states with a lower one, it's possible that the cantilevers might be a little bit shorter, especially if they were purchased by another company. Most cantilevers in my area seem to be purchased by SafeTran. This website belongs to Siemens Mobility, and here you can see that their cantilever design has 17 feet of clearance. Sadly, I couldn't find any info on the exact height of a SafeTran cantilever, which is the most common type used in my area at least, but I think we can assume that they're at least 17 feet tall since that seems to be the norm for these. So, in short, if you're carrying an oversized trailer that has close to 17 feet of clearance, you might want to think twice before driving under a cantilever. This is the oldest cantilever design ever built. Only one of them was built, and sadly it's no longer in use anymore, because it was a prototype and it had a few flaws in it. This railroad crossing device was used to warn people of a dangerous railroad crossing on the Illinois Central Railroad. It is called the Billups Neon Crossing Sign. Some people call it the Stop Death Stop Railroad Crossing Sign for obvious reasons. This sign was truly unique in its design. When it activated, the word Stop Death Stop would flash on neon red and purple signs. An arrow would illuminate telling you which direction the train was coming from, and the skull and crossbones would also flash. This crossing, unlike regular ones, had an air raid siren equipped on it instead of a regular railroad crossing bell, and this is what it sounded like.
as you can see, it would be rather difficult to miss a crossing sign like this. However, it still wasn't very successful. One of the reasons is that air raid siren that you just heard. It would sometimes go off even when there wasn't a train coming. In other words, a malfunction. And it would do this for hours after the train passed until the railroad crew could come by and turn it off manually. This obviously didn't sit well with residents who lived near the crossing as they had to listen to this air raid siren for hours on end. Another issue with this crossing was neon turned out to be very scarce, so it wasn't really the proper fuel to use to light up a railroad crossing. So the regular devices turned out to be a lot more viable. However, railroads began to notice the importance of overhead signals. They can be used to make the crossing more visible in areas where it's hidden from view from things like trees and buildings. Here's an example. This is a railroad crossing on Township Line Road near Bath, Pennsylvania. As you can see, the left side is partially hidden by this tree, but the cantilever makes it more visible. Also, on multi-lane roads, cantilevers can help provide extra visibility so that large vehicles in the right lane don't completely mask it from view if you're driving a smaller vehicle on the left lane. If you cross railroad crossings in the state of New Jersey, you might come across these overhead wires. These are called catenary lines. They provide electricity to the electric trains that use them. New Jersey Transit uses electric trains on all of their routes that run to New York because there is a law against diesel-powered trains entering the Hudson River tunnels. As a result, you'll sometimes find yourself crossing one of these railroad crossings with overhead wires. So, it is very important to know how tall these wires are. This is the tallest train car used by New Jersey Transit, a bi-level passenger car. These cars, as you can see, have two floors on them so that twice as many passengers can fit in the same space. These train cars are 14 feet tall. At their shortest, the power lines, or the catenary lines, over the track are 14 feet 6 inches tall. The pantograph, which is that red metal frame on the roof of the locomotive, can rise and fall depending on the height of the catenary lines. For that reason, you might find that on some section of the track, the wires are taller than 14 feet, 6 inches. In fact, they can be up to 22 and a half feet. This is because certain train cars that aren't owned by New Jersey Transit are taller and have to share these tracks. So the wires have to be tall enough that they would fit under. These are auto rack cars, which are the tallest freight cars in use. They are 20 feet tall. so catenary lines over these would have to be 22 and a half feet tall. So on sections where passenger and freight trains share the tracks, the catenary lines will be pretty high above the track. 22 and a half feet of clearance is pretty generous, but one electric railroad in New Jersey threatens to undermine your career as a commercial motor vehicle driver in the form of low-hanging wires, and that is the Hudson Bergen Light Rail. These train cars are a lot shorter than the auto rack freight cars, obviously, but they're even shorter than the shortest New Jersey Transit passenger car, which is this one, the Comet car. New Jersey Transit's Comet cab cars are a little over 12 feet tall, but the Hudson Bergen light rail cars are even shorter than that. Exactly how short is unknown to me. I could not find any information that specifically stated how tall these cars are. However, I can tell you for a fact that a truck cannot fit under the catenary lines that these trains use, and this is why. Here a truck driver was trying to cross the railroad crossing of the Hudson Bergen Light Rail, and his dumper ended up hitting the wires and knocking them down. This of course put the electric trains out of service in that area. Now, these dump trucks are usually a little bit shorter than the average 13 foot 6 inch high truck trailers. So, if he can't fit under these catenary lines, then chances are you won't if you're carrying a 13 foot 6 inch high trailer. 
So if you see the Hudson Bergen light rail, my advice would be to stay clear from any railroad crossings that use this, because you probably won't fit under these wires. I'm not sure if a bus would fit under it, but I definitely know that a truck would not fit under it. A trolley bus is an electric bus that draws electricity from catenary lines just like an electric train does. Sadly, I'm not sure how tall these catenary lines are either. I personally wouldn't try to cross under them. Now we're going to talk briefly about overpasses, railroad overpasses to be exact. Now this type of derailment is pretty rare, but it is something that I was pretty concerned about when I first started driving trucks. I remember the first time I crossed under a railroad overpass while there was a train driving across it. And I remember thinking to myself, I wonder what would happen if that train derailed while I was crossing under the bridge. That couldn't be a pretty picture. Now, this type of derailment is really rare because railroad bridges have guide rails on them. If a train derails while crossing the bridge, usually the guide rails will keep them on the track until they get to the other side of the bridge at the very least. In fact, one train driver was telling me about a time when he was crossing a bridge and one of his train cars derailed, but the guide rails kept it on the track until it crossed the bridge, and then it derailed into a Dunkin' Donuts parking lot. <laughs> So yeah, these guide rails do work, but if the train is traveling fast enough over the speed limit, the guide rails won't do much to keep it on the track. And that's what happened here. The train was over speeding and derailed as it crossed over the Interstate 5, and it derailed onto the highway. Now, sadly, the roofs of two truck trailers were struck as the train came crashing down. And I wouldn't be surprised if Higher Right placed on their driving record that they were struck by a train, quote unquote. Because higher right is like that. They always word it in such a way that it sounds way worse than what happened. A potential employer, if they saw that, would think, oh, he must have been racing a train to a crossing and then got hit by the train. But no, he was just minding his own business. They were minding their own business, driving under the bridge, and then the train just derailed on top of them. <laughs> like, that literally wasn't their fault. But obviously, if you tried to explain that to a potential employer, they wouldn't believe you, because they never do. Man, this guy is lucky the train wasn't crossing the bridge when he hit it. The train would have fallen on top of him and he might have died. That is why you have to be really careful when crossing under railroad bridges. Most of them are not tall enough to fit a truck under. Now, if you're on a highway, like a US highway or an interstate, they're supposed to be tall enough that you'll fit under. So, I'm not entirely sure what happened here. This looks like a U.S. highway of some sort. So, he should have fit under it. So, I, I, I'm not really sure what happened here. Maybe he was carrying a flatbed with an overheight trailer. I don't know. Like most bridges, railroad bridges have height clearance signs that mark the amount of overhead clearance they have. Except when they don't. Two types of bridges you should never try to cross under as a truck driver are train station bridges and elevated subway bridges. They're usually not tall enough to fit a truck under. Well, that's all I have for today. In the next part, I'm going to discuss wigwag railroad crossing devices.